Hello, am I audible? You can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, do you have any questions from the uh, last class? Let me share my screen and I'll open that file as well. Yeah, so uh, we were uh, solving uh, some problems for circular motion. We were doing this problem, right? So I think we'll continue with this problem. And uh, do you have any uh, problems or any questions from anything that we have covered so far? Uh, no, sir, no problems. No problem. Did you get time to go through uh, the topic that we have been doing? Have you gone through uh, it? Sir, I didn't have the notes. All right, uh, you're not making any notes while uh, we're doing this. You can you can make notes. I I don't mind. Uh, you can make notes, and uh, I'll sh also share these notes. I also did not get the time because I'm uh, I have been a bit busy adjusting the schedule and everything. So uh, hopefully uh, from uh, next week, things will be much more better and smooth. Uh, do you uh, 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 just give me your opinion? Are you comfortable if the class happens in the morning? Like, uh, let's say it starts around, like 9, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Sure, sir. Pakistan uh, time? No Pakistan time, yeah. Sure, sir, no problem. Okay, okay. That, that's, that's great. Okay. So... Yeah, so I think we'll uh, continue with this and hopefully we'll even start the next chapter of gravitational fields today. So uh, should we start this problem from the beginning or do you remember what we were doing? I remember, sir. Okay, perfect. So we were about to solve this problem for phi, right? We wanted to uh, find the angle uh, if there is no tendency for the car to slide. So the car does, if, what is that optimal angle? Just pay, the car will not skid on this surface, right? So that's what we wanted to uh, calculate. So the condition for no skidding is that the car must be in the equilibrium state. Right, And if the car is in an equilibrium state, that means it will not slide up or down. So it will not accelerate or decelerate. And so in that case, the forces must balance each other. Is that cool, right? So, so if I resolve my uh, forces vertically, then I have this R cos phi. And there is only this vertical and this vertical force, but they're opposite to each other. So I can write down plus or R cos phi minus mg. And because this vertically, the system is also in equilibrium. So this should be equal to zero. And this gives me plus R cos phi is equal to mg. So this is one of the equations, right? So is there any problem in this equation? No, sir. Okay, perfect. Then uh, I can also and write another equation using the, uh, what do you call that? Resolving horizontally, right? So if, if I look at the horizontal components, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot to uh, make my screen a bit. I did, I forgot to zoom it. Uh, I just, I just realized I, I apologize for that. So, the, uh, the horizontal component, you can see that there is uh, only this one horizontal component, R sine phi, but this component is actually responsible for the centripetal force, right? Because this, this component is what is keeping this uh, car in a circular orbit, right? And that have to be a horizontal component, right? A vertical component will not be able to keep uh, maintain the, uh, what do you call that, centripetal force, right? Because that is uh, the vertical component is dealing with balancing the weight of the car. And this horizontal component will balance the uh, centripetal force part. 
right? So the, this part is contributing to the centripetal force. Hence, the centripetal force is actually the resultant of R sine phi. So from this, I can say that R sine phi is equal to the centripetal force. So I can write down that as M V squared over R. Okay, so that, that's cool. Because I did not use the other expression, which is MR omega something, MR omega square something. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you look at, back at your question, the velocity that we were provided with, that it's traveling on a track with tangential velocity, 32 meters per second, remember? So, so I'll use the expression for centripetal force that involves the tangential velocity. So is this equation also clear? It's clear, this thing? I'll actually uh, use small r for radius because then this capital R, we're using it for the force, right? Okay, so if, if there is no problem in this part, so uh, let's call this equation one and let's call this equation two. And let's basically, we don't know the value of R, right? So we don't know what R is. So I need a method so that I can eliminate R. So what I can do is I can divide equation two and one. So we'll, what I'll do is take equation two divided by equation one. So that means what I'm doing is equation two is R sine phi is equal to M V squared by R. We'll divide this by equation one. So equation one, we have left-hand side R cos phi. So that's R cos phi. And we have uh, on the right-hand side, we have MG, so MG, which eliminates R and it gets rid of the mass as well. And we're left with, well, what is sine over cos? From mathematics and trigonometry, we know that that's simply tangent. And we have angle phi. This is equal to V squared over R divided by G. So that becomes V squared over G times R. So that's the equation now. Uh, I shouldn't have not used equal to sign, just put this arrow. And this is our equation. From this, we know the uh, we know the radius r. We know this. We know the velocity. It's given in the question. The value of g is also known, and we can just simply take the tangent inverse of this thing and compute for phi. So let's do it over here. Uh, phi will be phi will be tangent inverse of v squared, which is well, it's just, now it's just a matter of putting the values, right? So radius is 120 meters and velocity is 32 meters per second. So 32 meters per second squared divided by, uh, we have G, which is, a, let's just use 10 meters per second squared. And then we have R, which was, uh, I forgot it said uh, 120 meters, right? So we have 120 meters. Now just come evaluate this and you get 41 degrees. Now, what is this 41 degrees? This 41 degrees is that particular or it is that optimal angle on which if I incline this track at, for, uh, what was the angle I got, 41. If I incline this uh, slope or track at 41 degrees, in that case, the car will maintain an equilibrium state while it moves on this track, right? In the circular path, it can it will move on the track on the circular path, but it will not skid up and down the road. So that's how uh, the race driver, racers, or, or whatever they they maintain their vehicle without skidding, right? So they can speed up without skidding. Uh, is this cool? Uh, is there any problem in this uh, part A? Okay, perfect, perfect.
Sounds great. Now, uh, let's read what was part B. Okay, suggest and explain what would happen if the car's speed was reduced. So the speed is being reduced. Any, uh, any idea what would happen? Any, uh, I'd like to hear your opinion. What would happen if, if the car speeds, speed is reduced? The angle would decrease. Uh, well, uh, the car is moving, uh, it, it, it's, this is the ground, right? So if the speed of the car decreases, uh, it will not basically affect this level of the ground, right? So the angle, uh, the angle would not be affected, but nice, uh, nice try. You can think of something else. Do you understand why the angle will not decrease by the way? Because it, it, the, this is the slope on which, the, on which the car is, right? So it's just... Uh, it, 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 like it, it's a concrete kind of thing, and like it this is a cannot fixed slope. Yeah, it's a fixed slope exactly. So anything else that could happen? Think in terms of the centripetal force. It's mv squared over r, right? So we're saying that the speed slows down. So that means v would decrease. So the centripetal so the force will also decrease? Yeah, exactly. So the centripetal force will decrease, which means that the car would basically slip down because at now the, the required centripetal force is not being met, right? So now the centripetal force has decreased so it's not at its optimal level to keep the car moving without skidding. So the centripetal force will decrease. And so the, uh, the car would basically skid down. So is that clear? Why, why would the car fa fall a bit lower? Or it would move, you can say in this diagram, it would move a bit to this side. Yes, sir. Because yeah, so, so, so the centripetal force has been reduced. Okay, so, right, so perfect. So I think that completes this thing. And I don't think we have any more. So for now, this is, uh, this completes uh, the circular motion part. Let's, uh, let's start the next chapter, which is of gravitation. Uh, do you have any, uh, well, because you did not get time to, and I did not even share the notes with you. So I think you, uh, well, you can, I'll share these notes with you as soon as possible, right? Let's see, I'll try it today. And uh, you can let me know if you have any problems or anything, we can discuss it in next class as well, right? Uh, and in on Friday, uh, we'll solve more problems regarding to uh, the, this first chapter that we have completed and we'll hopefully try to uh, complete this chapter as well by Friday and we'll solve problems. So, yeah. So, but is there any, any anything on your mind before we start uh, with this chapter? No, sir. Okay, perfect. So, so the, the, the next chapter is uh, gravitation. And it's actually a very, uh, do you have any idea about, have you gone through, have you read, uh, or is this your first time? About gravity, sir? Yeah, about, uh, uh, well, reading this, this chapter of gravitation from your, your A-level syllabus. Have you gone through this uh, topic before? No, sir, it would be the first time. It would be the first time. So I guess let's start it in this way. Um, one second. Let's fix this. So basically the idea is, uh, well, I'm sure you know all the story behind it, uh, how Newton wrote down the laws of gravity. Uh, the question that he proposed, he asked himself, that why does, if the apple fall, why does the moon does not fall to the earth and all of those things, right? 
and so basically what newton gave you newton gave us a a, a law for a force of gravity which is we'll we'll talk about this in detail but it's minus g m m by r uh, i think it's minus g m m by r squared right so this is what newton gave us but newton himself did not know what cause what is the source of this gravity so if you think about it you, you, we have this we have sun and we have earth which is orbiting the sun right it's orbiting the sun there is nothing that is attached between the two right so the, it's not like there is some string that is um, keeping this earth in a in a circular motion around the sun right there is nothing like that so it was very confusing it is very weird to think of it that there is a, some action at a distance happening so there is nothing that is connecting these two things but there is still the earth still feels the effect of the sun right the force of the sun you can say and so it turns out that we can definitely we can use newton's laws for the most part but newton's idea they were uh, they had they had a problem and they are not the correct uh, rules but they, they but they work they work and they work for the most part of it but the true nature of gravity is uh, it's a geometry right so it's not a force it's not a force like you experience uh, like you experience electromagnetism for example it's not a force in that sort of a way it's actually the geometry and the geometry comes from something that is called uh, space time right so uh, newton did not know about this and so he did not know what was the source of gravity but the source of gravity is space time itself now it's a weird thing but space and time they are uh, they are you can say that the, these two are one object space and time is not separate but it's one object and it might seem weird at first but let me give you an example when whenever you uh, have to go somewhere for example you 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 call your friend and you you decide to get together meet up or whatever right so you decide a place but can you just tell them that you know uh, come at this place they'll ask you for more what would they ask you for what is the other piece of information that you need to tell them to make this meeting happen directions uh yeah di directions and everything is given uh, let's say yeah you you give them the direction you say that you have to meet at this place okay up for example you are um you're meeting at let's say pizza hut you're you're going to meet at pizza hut or just an example right what else do you have to tell them to meet at pizza hut so you have just tell specific location yeah the specific location part is done the other thing is time right it's time because unless you specify when are you going to meet them the meeting may not even happen right so uh, you agree with that right yes sir yeah so you would have to tell them the location exactly like you said the location but you also have to tell them time without these two things together you will not be able to meet and that's fascinating because if you think about that this means already space and time have been always connected but you never thought about it in this way we never thought about it in this way before but if you think about this example it seems very obvious that yes space and time must be connected because you one does not really give you that much information without the other and that's pretty fascinating right so so that's the idea of space time and this curve space time basically curves it bends and it performs all these things that you can do with something that is malleable so space time is malleable and you can bend it you can curve it and that's why we experience gravity because of the bending of space and time now uh, it space time bends in a sort of a very weird way 
you might have maybe you have seen some videos on youtube or something but it's not really like that because those are one or two dimensional uh, things but space time is something that is a three dimensional thing and uh, actually three spatial dimensions so there are three dimensions of space and one dimension is uh, for time anyways we are getting too ahead of ourselves uh, the, these are some just some of the interesting factors things that uh, so basically gravity is a very fascinating a uh, topic actually so anyways uh, i think we should get uh, into the topic now so first of all we need to understand what is a field before we even talk about gravitational field we need to have an understanding of uh, what is a field so now you can, you'll see many definitions for a field so a field mathematically you can say that a field is uh, it's a set right it's a set on which you can perform addition subtraction multiplication and division so it's a set where all of these operations are defined and they behave as operations on on real numbers on real or rational numbers right and that's something that a mathematician would call a field for a physics point of view we can just say that a field is something let me write it down as well it's something which takes values at every point at each point right now think about this uh think about temperature in a room let's say this is a room right let me just draw so this is a room and let's say that there is a window over here right so this is a window now in this room let's say there is some uh, fireplace over here as well so there is fire and just ignore my drawing but this is just some fire now if i were to sit or stand in this room and measure temperatures so i would have at every point there will be a value for temperature right so if i measure with my thermometer or whatever i measure it near this fireplace the temperature would be high right you agree with that right so the temperature near this fireplace would be very high right you you agree with that right sir can you explain it again please yeah so basically i was uh, i was giving an example of a field so i just said that it is something that will take values at every point in space a field is defined as something that takes a value a number a constant at each point in space so i said let's consider this room there is this room and say suppose for example this it has a window at some point at some place and there is a fireplace at some place so there is some fire over here in this room right so when you measure temperatures near this near this fire if you take pick this point and you put your thermometer at this point the temperature would be high right near a fireplace the temperature would be high so you agree with that right yes okay perfect and similarly if i measure it somewhere over near the window the temperature would be low it would be cooler and somewhere in between the its temperature would have some different values right so you get this concept of temperature would take different values at each point in this room is that clear yes sir exactly so so temperature is a field the, and what we were talking about all this time was a temperature field so at every point in this uh, room you can assign a value and so what we were measuring was temperature and hence that was a temperature field right similarly now we can talk about gravitational field so basically a gravitational field is 
a field in the similar manner. So suppose that you have, this is your space. And in this, there is this gravitational field. And the space is filled with gravitational field. Now, when you put an object in this field, suppose there you have this object, let's call it, this is the sun. So what happens is this will, this mass will basically, you can say it would give rise to the gravitational field such that if suppose that that, that gravitational field will have effects only in this region, this, uh, what do you call this, uh, this rectangle that I drew. So the gravitational field can only affect this much part that is coming due to the sun. And that's because of the inverse square law, which we'll get into it. But if I put an object over here, let's say this is the earth, earth will experience this gravitational force of the sun simply because of the fact that when the sun was sitting in this space, it produced gravitational field, which if I put this object, if I put the earth near this sun, then it would experience this gravitational field and hence it would fall into the orbit of the sun. So that's why the gravitational field strength is defined as a gravitational force per unit mass at any particular point. Would the gravitational field acting on both objects be constant? Uh, the gravitational uh, the gravitational field acting on these two uh, objects yes sir yeah it would be it would be constant right so basically what would happen is if if i have this sun suppose that it's a sun when i uh, if it's sitting in space it would basically produce a gravitational field and then i put another object suppose this is earth i put earth in that gravitational field Earth would also create its own gravitational field, but it will also be affected by the gravitational field of the sun, right? Because of course, uh, Earth or sun, none of them is special. If, I, if, uh, if the sun is creating a gravitational field, what it essentially means is that any mass that I put in space would create a gravitational field, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so now the gravitational field strength, the strength of the gravitational field, it would be greater near a massive object, right? So for example, if I have this sun, the gravitational field strength would be higher where you have a more, more, more mass, right? So that, that was uh, what I was trying to get across because gravitational field strength is then related to mass because if anything that has mass and it sits in space, it produces gravitational field. Now the strength of that field depends on how massive my object is. The more the mass it has, the more gravitational field strength it would Create, uh, produce. So that's, uh, that's clear, right? Because, and that's the reason that the sun has a higher gravitational effect, right? Compared to, so for example, uh, we have sun, we have earth, earth is orbiting the sun, then the moon, it's orbiting the earth because for moon, it's closer to the earth and it orbits the earth because earth also produces some gravitational field. And you can even find the orbital radius for moon. So if I, so for example, uh, you know that uh, even uh, your earth, it's surrounded by lots of space junk, basically. So whenever you have astronauts, they go in space, uh, they have to eat and everything, right? So they, when they get rid of those uh, materials, they just put them out in space and then it, our space, uh, the orbit of the earth, it's filled with a lot of junk. And that's there because it is th th those junk, they have mass. So for example, you could have a wrapper of chocolate, you could, have, uh, you could have a wrapper of chips or anything of that sort, right? Because it has mass, it is affected by the field of the field that was produced 
in the space due to the earth so so is is that clear the the idea of gravitational field yes sir okay so now we can move on to the newton's law of gravitation and the newton's law of gravitation basically says that if you have two masses so if let's say this is a mass and you have another mass so these are two different masses there will be some place uh, or there will be some extreme points you can say where these two would uh, feel the effects of each other so in in such a way that these masses would basically attract with each other and the further that i keep moving these masses the less the force affects that these will experience on in, on each other and that is dictated by this inverse square relationship uh, let me use this this one 1 over r squared right so increasing the distance would decrease the force right so increasing distance would decrease force you can say four times so if you increase the distance by two times the force would decrease by four times because it is r squared right so is that point clear yes sir okay so so that's what happens right and the this ex, you can mathematically write this down with this expression f is equal to g mm by r squared so what's happening is actually there sh there should be a negative sign over here as well if you do not include the uh, i think uh, when writing this down they have included this uh, this thing what do you call that uh, the sign for the di the direction of r as well in this uh, r squared but let's say that uh, there is no direction then you have to put this minus sign and i'll explain why this uh, there is this negative sign as well but uh, so the force is actually proportional to because uh, as we said about the gravitational field strength the more massive the more the gravitational field strength and if gravitational field strength is more that means the force would be more right because it would experience more effects of gravity and hence the force would be higher so the force is proportional to the masses of the object so let's say if it's either if it's m or if it's m right so both of the masses the force is proportional to those masses but it is inversely proportional to the rate distance between those masses so this r is basically the distance from this to this mass the center of that mass to the center of this mass that's r and so once i uh, have to write this down equation write this equation in terms of equality equal sign so i have to introduce a constant which is known as g which is the universal constant of gravity right or it's the uh, actually it's written over here i don't need to write it down so it's the universal gravitational constant sir what is the difference between the small m and capital m right exactly so one of the mass is uh, so it's basically one mass is for one object and the other mass is for the other object Th think about this we're talking about force of gravity so it 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 appears in pairs right there it had so there has to be if there is one mass it has to be attracted to another mass so there is this pair of two masses right so one of the m and the, they are being multiplied so the order does not matter if i put this here or put this here it it doesn't matter so because they they are being multiplied right so one mass it you can sometimes it's also called that m is the source mass and small m is the test mass okay i'll tell you the reason for this so for example you have sun the uh, the sun over here and then you have earth which is orbiting the sun then i can say that capital m is the mass of the sun because sun is the source of gravity which this earth is experiencing so that's why m is referred to as source mass and small m is the mass of the earth which is a test mass 
So you're just testing that mass because you can you could have picked any other mass. So for example, there was Venus, planet Venus over here. It would have some mass. So that, that so any mass it would have. That's also a test mass. But because both of these planets are under the influence of this source mass gravity. So that's why capital M is also called the source mass and small m is called the test mass. So is that clear? Yes, sir. Perfect. So let me check how much time do we have left in this meeting? Four minutes. Uh, can you Four minutes. Okay, so let's see how much more we can cover in. Right, so is the idea of uh, uh, the this Newton's law of gravitation clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So next is that you're deriving Newton's law of gravitation. So gravitational field strength at a point is already defined, right? So you now you know uh, the gravitational field strength. What does it mean? to be defined at any particular point in space, right? So it's actually the gravitational force that the object will experience per unit mass at that point. Now, uh, so then you can write it, it's actually written over here, you can write it mathematically as G is equal to F over M. Why? Because uh, as we have defined it, it is the gravitational force per unit mass. And we give it a symbol small g. This is the same G that we have as equal to 9.81. We have been using it for a very long time now, right? So it's that same G. So that's the gravitational field strength. So the number 9.81 meters per second squared is telling you the strength of the gravity. So the higher that number is, the more force there would be between the two objects. Right, so that's why on moon the number is smaller compared to this the number on the Earth, and that's why on moon when you jump you can easily, uh, you know, uh, you can well I don't know how to say it, but you can float and all right easily in moon compared to uh, on the surface of the Earth. So if this is uh, g, which is equal to f by m, then by the Newton's law of gravitation we know that we wrote it up over here. It's defined as this GMM by R squared. I can put this value in this uh, expression, right? So upon doing so, we get G is equal to GMM by R squared into this one over M, right? So this cancels and we are left with this expression. And hence, we can say that the gravitational field strength of any uh, mass is defined with this equation. G is equal to GM by R squared, where M is the source mass. So you can see what happened over here is that the test mass was eliminated from the equation. So the test mass does not matter. And you should, and that should be obvious because uh, the source mass is creating the gravity which any other mass around it would experience. So the field strength of gravity should only depend on that mass that I put in there in the first place, which is producing the effects of gravity. So if you think of this example where you had the sun, so the gravity that this earth would experience is coming from the mass of the sun. The mass of the earth does not matter, right? Because earth is experiencing the gravity the gravity which was created by this mass of the sun. So is that clear? 